and thanks everyone for joining me today. Um, I'll be presenting um, my thesis as a whole pretty much today. So generally my title is Bushmeat Hunting in Malawi, a multifaceted approach um, to try and understand this complex social ecological issue. I'm at the Environmental Futures Research Institute at Griffith and my supervisors for this project are Kerry Wilson and Duan Biggs. Um, so I'll give a brief overview. I'll start with trying to provide some context to this issue um, and then going over the overall process I used in my thesis, um, including trying to understand the overall prevalence of these illegal activities in Malawi, um, and then moving on to looking at different interventions that could be used to um, uh, mitigate this problem. Um, and finally, using this information in a decision-making context to try and help um, policymakers to move forward on the, the issue. Um, and then I'll be talking about uh, what's next. And I'd just like to thank all my partners and my funders um, who worked with me on this research. So generally, um, I'll just start with a brief definition. Um, bushmeat is defined as pretty much any non-domesticated terrestrial mammal, bird, reptile, or amphibian, which is harvested specifically for the purpose of food. Um, so this term generally doesn't include things like fish or invertebrates, um, but you could argue that they should be included. And it includes all steps in the supply chain. So it includes both um, hunting or acquisition of the meat, um, trading it and consuming it. Um, so we, I'm sure you are all familiar with the term wicked problems by now. These are problems that are not merely just complex, but they are um, really multifaceted and very difficult to solve. So here's a little diagram I thought was quite interesting about um, why they're so difficult to solve. And bushmeat fits into many of these categories. For example, it um, includes things about our values or beliefs. It has very many interconnected problems and um, there are very, you know, grand expectations for solutions to these, to these issues. So yeah, it's a, it's a difficult challenge. There are so many factors, including food security, uh, governance issues, um, livelihood issues. And then obviously what we're interested in is uh, conservation problems. So bushmeat in um, terms of scientific research, uh, it's mostly been focused on forest systems. So specifically the Congo Basin and the Amazon Basin have been really focused on in terms of research on this issue. Um, however, it's likely that it's, it's a problem in savannas and other, other habitats as well. Um, and it's important to recognize the distinction between forest and savanna systems. So um, savannas are much more productive, both in terms of animal biomass and livestock than forests. And um, wildlife has a very big role in many um, savanna countries' uh, GDPs. So there are potentially more um, points, leverage points to change the situation in savannas than in forests, potentially. Um, so this diagram that I have up here is from a systematic literature review I did, which uh, illustrates the number of studies that have been conducted in Savannah regions. And we see that um, almost all of the studies come from just one country, namely Tanzania, with very large gaps in knowledge geographically um, in Southern Africa, so places like Angola or Mozambique. And then also in the Sahelian region, so that would be Mali, Niger, Chad, Sudan, that region also is very much lacking in any research on this issue. The, the map on the right also shows the difference um, in terms of where these studies have been located. So almost all the studies about bushmeat hunting in savannas are located in the context of protected areas and very few are 
in the context of communal or other land. Um, yeah, so this highlights some key gaps in research and today I'll be talking to you about one specific country, namely Malawi. Um, it's a very small country uh, in southern Africa which is dominated by a very large lake um, that many of you might have seen pictures of or be familiar with the, the endemic uh, fish that are located in that lake. Um, but in terms of other conservation issues, we see that bushmeat hunting has received almost no scientific study. We do suspect it's a very large issue because the protected areas in these um, regions have been prior, about 10 years ago, they were almost all of them were in a relatively semi-collapsed state, which means that they had very, very low densities of wildlife. There was rampant illegal activities happening in these parks. However, recently there's been a massive push by the Malawian government and other international actors to um, bring conservation to the forefront of Malawi um, by investing in protected areas. So we've seen things like um, very much uh, stricter penalties for wildlife crimes um, become, uh, become law. We've also seen things like um, public relations campaigns, which is what these two pictures are showing. So it's a rapidly changing environment, but we just simply don't have the knowledge of uh, the robust scientific evidence to actually estimate or understand the drivers of these um, illegal activities in the protected areas of Malawi. So that's what my PhD was trying to look at. Um, these are just the, the general aims of my thesis. I've already spoken a bit about analyzing the literature, so I'll be talking today about these three um, sections. So the first uh, section of my talk will be talking about investigating the prevalence and drivers of bushmeat hunting in Malawi. Um, and then I will talk about the how we can manage this problem in terms of interventions and understanding how communities may respond to a range of different interventions. And then finally, um, facilitating decision making among stakeholders using information and their own expert knowledge. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, in terms of locations, I looked at four different protected areas in Malawi. So those are Nika National Park uh, and Fwaza Marsh Wildlife Reserve, which are both located in the north. Um, they are managed by the government of Malawi. Um, they are relatively under-resourced and are unfenced, majority are unfenced. Um, and this is rather different to the other two protected areas. So those are in Kota Kota and Majeti, um, which are managed by the international NGO African Parks in a delegated co-management scheme. So these protected areas have received a lot more financial um, investment in the past 10 years or so. So yeah, the, that's the, the context that I'll be, I'll be working in and explaining the results for. Okay, so the first stage of the research is um, trying to understand the prevalences of these illegal activities. Um, and to do that, we used a sociodemographic survey of households in around these four protected areas. Um, we in, ended up interviewing around 1,500 households. And um, part of the survey was using a specialized interview technique called the unmatched count technique, um, which is a method which can help us understand um, the prevalences of illegal activities because what it does, it is it anonymizes people's answers for a sensitive issue, but it can provide an aggregate prevalence of the activity. So the overall percentage of people undertaking the illegal activity. And how it works is um, the, you give people one of two cards, either a control or a treatment card, as I've indicated down here. And the only difference between them is they, they both have 
a number of different activities, for example, but the treatment card also includes the sensitive item. And then you ask people not which activities they did, but rather how many. And then you can just find a, a difference in means estimate to find um, the prevalence of that specific activity. So in terms of results, these are these are the results for the prevalence of hunting at all four of the protected areas. And we asked um, this question for two, two different for the two seasons, the dry season and the wet season. And we can see that there are some seasonal trends between the different parks, but generally we see that hunting was between, on average, around 10% of the um, communities surrounding these protected areas were hunting at some stage during these seasons. And this peaked um, at around 19% at Nika in the wet season. So these are definitely concerning numbers, given how many communities actually live, I mean, how many households actually live around these protected areas. Um, we did the same for consumption of bushmeat, and obviously these numbers are a bit higher because you can um, feed many households from one hunting event. So generally we see that they're all around, let's say 15 to 20%, speaking at around 40% of households in these communities hunting, I mean, consuming bushmeat at some stage in the wet season. So these are definitely concerning numbers. Um, but excitingly, we were also able to link these activities to other sociodemographic drivers. So this, um, these two graphs are showing uh, the differences between those two card types um, in terms of poverty levels. So a BNS score is just a, a base a measure of poverty um, going from the poorest households on the on the left side of the scale to the wealthiest households. Um, and what we're seeing here for the first graph is that um, the difference between the control and treatment indicates some level of bushmeat consumption. So we're seeing that poorer households actually consume more bushmeat than wealthier households. Um, this is the opposite is observed in hunting, where we see that wealthier households are actually more likely to hunt than poorer households. I've just picked out some interesting other interesting drivers that we found. So for example, this is looking at um, the num how the number of projects, community-based park projects that people were involved in, how this affects these uh, two illegal activities. And what we found was that um, there were differences between parks. So for example, in Majeti, which was a highly resourced park, a park with lots of resources, um, bushmeat hunting, sorry, bushmeat consumption actually increased when people were involved with more community-based projects. We still saw the opposite effect in Boise Marsh, which was a relatively under-resourced park, where the number of, as, as people participated in more projects, the, the, the less they hunted. So, so some really interesting drivers coming out here. Um, and we also asked people about their motivations. This was a direct question, um, why they think people in their community may either eat or hunt bushmeat. And uh, the reasons for eating bushmeat were quite interesting in that the majority of people actually said it was because it tastes good. Um, and then the next most common motivation was because it was cheaper than livestock meat. And then also another important reason was that um, it added diversity to people's diets. Um, in terms of hunting, no surprises that most people hunted because it provided extra income and because it provided meat for their households. But there were some interesting relationships in terms of the fact that um, because it's uh, perceived as part of their culture, because it's perceived as a right. Things like that were also um, important reasons for hunting bushmeat.
So just to summarize this research, um, this first stage of the, the research project, um, we know that bushmeat hunting and consumption definitely exists at levels high enough for concern. Um, hunting and consumption do not necessarily have the same drivers, which is very important in terms of designing interventions. Um, and current projects, even those implemented at parks with significant resources, may not actually be working as expected. And um, we also didn't look at what species were being hunted in what proportions, which will have very big effects on how sustainable or unsustainable these hunting rates are. So that's something for future research. So if you'd like to learn a bit more about this stage of the research, please, we've um, had a paper published in Biodiversity and Conservation. So go get that a read. The next section of the research was looking at interventions to reduce bushmeat hunting. Um, interventions in this context are often very, very complex to implement and to understand as well as to get results from because they don't always work as expected as we can expect from a wicked problem. There are so many feedbacks and complications that it's actually very difficult for practitioners to choose. So how do you, how do you decide what intervention to implement when money is scarce? So what we decided to do is use a predictive approach where we asked people how they would respond to a range of different interventions um, prior to the implementation. So we used a scenario approach um, to understand pe the community's perceptions of a range, a range of different um, interventions. So how this works, this is just a little diagram of our methods. Basically what happened is we used that larger socio-demographic survey, which I've already discussed, and then we stratified um, the participants by a few different measures and selected a about 250 people to go and revisit for this second survey. And then we asked them about seven different um, potential scenarios. Um, each one had a specific conditionality attached to it, which means that there was a certain penalty um, for committing a wildlife crime. And then we uh, used a number of proxy indicators to understand people's responses to these scenarios. So we looked at how people would perceive it in terms of fairness of the intervention, how they perceived it would change meat availability, and how it might change the time that they spend on their current activities. So these are our results. Um, if you're interested in reading a bit more about the scenarios, they're listed on the right there. So we had a number of different ones. For example, we had a scenario where people could harvest natural resources from the parks, things like honey or mushrooms, and then markets could be created for them to generate income. We also had a a, pro, a program that was um, helping people to start businesses. Um, we had livestock donation programs, uh, a skills training program, um, a program that allowed people to hunt in the park um, with certain conditions. This is currently completely illegal in Malawi, but we wanted to see just for interest sake, how people would respond to something like this if there were certain rules attached to it. And then as kind of a counterfactual, we, we investigated what would happen if um, enforcement levels were just doubled from current, current levels. Um, and so on the left, you can see the, the results of this study. So in terms of fairness, um, the, this graph shows um, the different little codes refer to the different scenarios. And these are the probabilities that people would give these different responses. So what we see here is that um, most people thought that the micro enterprise scenario or the livestock donation scenario was the fairest um, and surprisingly regulated hunting was seen as the least fair scenario. Um, although these, these both had 
pretty high levels of acceptability still. Um, in terms of a time scale, what we were looking at here is whether people would treat these different scenarios as either an addition, so they would continue what they were doing, including illegal hunting, and just do this program as another livelihood option, or whether they would treat these scenarios as a substitution, so they would switch their current activities, including illegal hunting, to do this um, program instead, or whether there would be no participation. And what we saw here is that only the micro enterprise programs and the skills programs actually had a high level of substitution. So that would mean that people are swapping out um, their activities with these, these programs. The other programs were unlikely to cause this change in time budgets. Um, the, next, the next thing we looked at was how people would perceive meat availability to change. So this is both livestock and bushmeat availability. And we see that almost all programs resulted in more meat availability for communities except enforcement. Obviously enforcement had a high, higher proportion of people saying that there, this would result in less meat in the community, obviously indicating the contribution that bushmeat has in terms of um, supplying protein to the communities. So some conclusions from this research, we know that um, it's really important to consider fairness because even programs that seem to make sense and were scaled to provide the same benefits, um, they might not be socially acceptable. Uh, we also saw that respondents were more likely to substitute their activities if you had an alternative income pro program that was not dependent on park products such as hunting or um, gathering natural resources like honey or fruits from the park. Um, and interestingly, enforcement wasn't seen as that unfair. It was actually positively um, perceived by a lot of people in the community probably because um, there was a growing recognition of the benefits that they could receive from the parks. Um, and then interestingly, regulated hunting was not perceived or seen as very fair and it does not cause people to substitute their, their activities. So this is showing that um, people may actually prefer to not hunt if they were given the choice. The final stage of our research was using a participatory decision-making process um, to kind of bring all of this data together and try and um, actually use it in a, in a practical way. So um, we know that achieving sound decision-making in these complex socio-ecological systems is very difficult, um, primarily because there are so many different competing objectives and there's large amounts of complexity and uncertainty. So um, although we have all this data, it's really important to use every resource that we can. And so we decided to involve experts in, our, in a participatory modeling process. Um, and in this case, it's important to acknowledge that here the process is as important as the outcome. So it's all about facilitating social learning, um, with experts, as well as um, using their, their knowledge to um, generate outcomes. So we held a two day workshop in Lilongwe in um, November of 2019 and invited a range of different uh, conservation experts from Malaw around Malawi. And what we did is we used a fuzzy cognitive mapping process, which um, is basically just a way of mapping a system in a semi-quantitative way. So it has a few different um, components to the process. The first one is just asking people to identify important concepts in the system. So here that might be the four, the five um, circles, so wetlands, fish, etc. Those were the important identified components in the system. Um, and then you also ask people to identify the relationships between these components. So are they positive 
as one increases, so does the other, or are they negative, which as one increases, the other decreases. And lastly, what is the strength of this relationship? So they could rate it on a scale from minus one to positive one. So positive one being a very strong relationship, while positive 0 0.2 would be a slightly weaker relationship. So it's just a way of visualizing and um, modeling complex systems while taking into account relationships between components. So we used a two-stage process here where um, firstly we asked prior to the workshop we asked individuals to complete a questionnaire and then we were able to use this questionnaire to convert their answers into um, some of these fuzzy cognitive maps. Um, we then combined all the different individual maps into one group map, which was prior to the workshop. Um, we then held the workshop and presented these maps to experts. And then we um, presented data and we had discussions um, to really draw out the key concepts and discuss these relationships in detail. And then during the workshop, we were able to finalize um, and finalize and make a group social cognitive map. What we can then use these maps to do is um, we can input a number of different interventions into the map and see how the system as a whole may potentially respond. Um, and that's really useful because you can test assumptions, identify um, weak points in knowledge, and um, maybe use it as a basis for further modeling. Okay, so these were the results um, for consumption. We model consumption and hunting separately, so it looks a bit complicated, but basically all of this is showing is the important components identified in the system and the um, different colored arrows indicate whether it was a positive relationship, um, which are the blue arrows, or a negative relationship, which are the orange arrows, and the uh, thickness of the lines of the arrows, although it's a bit difficult to see here, indicate the strengths of these relationships. So you can analyze these maps in a number of different ways, but I'll just um, show you one, which is understanding the centrality that a um, specific component may have. So that just indicates its overall contribution. And we found that these four um, components were very central to this map and had a large impact on the overall relationships. Um, this is our map for hunting, which was obviously much, much more complex. I suspect this is because um, these decision makers are probably more likely to have, you know, be in control of the hunting element of the, the system, while it's much more difficult to control the consumption element. So they probably have maybe a bit more knowledge about this, um, or else it could just be that it is a more complex system. Um, so again, I'll just present the most central variables, um, things like strength of law enforcement, effective perimeter fencing, effective prosecution, even things like drought. All of these, uh, these factors are, were perceived to have um, a very large impact on the map and be important in the overall system. So what we can then use these maps to do is we can run scenarios by inputting a specific intervention into the map and seeing how the states of each variable in the system might change. So the, the workshop participants chose to investigate three different interventions. They were ecotourism, microenterprises, and wildlife farming and the results on, are presented on the right. This is just a relative expected change of um, the different components in the system. So it's, it's uh, not exactly quantitative, but it gives you a, an idea of the magnitude of the potential change as well as the direction of the change. So um, A and B, uh, ecotourism and microenterprise are in relation to the hunting map, 
while wildlife farming was expected to um, impact both uh, hunting and consumption. And we can see that almost all of the components move in the direction that we would want them to. So for example, alternative livelihoods increase while uh, poverty and local demand for bushmeat might decrease. So this, this gives us some interesting um, options to consider in the future, as well as identifies um, potential areas in these maps where the experts just weren't sure what was happening. And so we know, know that we need to clarify these relationships more. All right, so those were the, the major components of my research for my thesis. So um, just to wrap up, I'll try and summarize what we learned in this process. So for the stage one process, where we were trying to understand and generate some robust estimates for consumption and hunting of bushmeat, we found that in Malawi, they definitely are existing at high, high levels high enough for conservation concern. Um, we know that interventions should be tailored um, to, to the differences in drivers between hunters and consumers. One, one intervention is really unlikely to be able to affect both of them. Um, and then generally, we, we would suggest that, you know, they, these kind of estimates of prevalence are replicated to at set intervals to understand how things are changing. Um, given that it's a highly dynamic environment at the moment, and there are there is a lot of international investment happening. Um, in terms of stage two, what we learned from the the exploration of different intervention programs, we know that um, projects that provide um, opportunities for development rather than relying on natural resources from the park were highly preferred and seen as fairer and also likely to actually change behaviors. Um, so it's really important to acknowledge that conservation professionals are unlikely to be able to um, properly impl Im implement these projects um, in terms of uh, their their resources, their skills, their expertise. So partnering with development agencies is important, but also making sure that these, these, these projects aren't just seen as development projects, that there is a very explicit link back to conservation in some way, so that um, it could be a positive link, it could be a negative link, but without it, it's, there is a risk that these projects might just be seen as a development project and not actually change conservation behaviors. Um, great, so then in stage three, um, what we found in terms of uh, this using participatory modeling processes, it was a very exciting, um, exciting process and we found that um, it did generate some, some really interesting and useful maps, but it also interest, it, um, was able to, to facilitate some really good dis discussion and there were some indications there was some really substantial social learning involved here. So we, we would suggest that wildlife farming be potentially um, investigated as this, this, what this intervention had really positive effects. And then, um, you know, using these maps in, in a practical way could be very exciting. So extending them to quantitative system dynamic models. So using them as a first step could be very, very interesting. So basically in the future, what I would say is this, the conservation sector cannot tackle this issue alone. Um, we need transdisciplinary and multi-sector cooperation because um, it's really important that we try and balance conservation goals with development goals, especially in contexts like Malawi. Um, Malawi is the eighth poorest country in the world, so it's incredibly important to to be aware of the, the multiple different um, constraints that conservation can face in these situations. And then finally, just not forgetting that cultural and taste factors were very important in terms of consumption, especially. So addressing this issue will require some level of cultural change and um, incorporation of traditional 
authorities. So yeah, that's, that's basically what I learned in my PhD. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please say out. Thanks so much.